Really excited today to be up here in Beverly Hills with a mega producer, Mike Bjorkman. Been in the business a long time, since he was 19 years old, and really has a lot of insight on how you can take over your local market and become the local celebrity. So looking forward to getting this started. Let's kick it off. Really excited to be sitting here today with Mike Bjorkman, um, one of the top teams in the nation for HomeSmart, if not the top team. Number one. Just recently won the award for top team in the nation at HomeSmart. One thing that you've done really well and become really successful at is kind of owning his market and being like the name in his market. And I just wanted to find out a little bit more about like, how did you do that? And mm -hmm. he's gonna share some of his strategies that he used to become the number one team in not only his market, but the entire company nationwide. Oh. First, we're gonna have a couple drinks of our Coronas. We're here at the Cheers, Montage brother. in Beverly Hills. And uh, let's jump right in. I'm ready. So. So why don't, why don't we start with, how did it start for you back when you were first kind of starting out and then how you took it to where, where it is today? Yeah, as I look back, it kind of goes in sections, right? Kind of, I've been in since 90, 91 now, let's call it 26 years. Um, I think as an agent, when I was new in the business, I was barely 19 years old, right? And who do we know at that age? Just high school kids, yeah. our friends, right? Right. Um, which was cool. Not a lot of people buying houses yet. Yeah, either not a lot or, you know, when I went to high school, I liked to have a lot of fun. And I wasn't known as a professional. I was known as the keg stand guy, the guy that would, uh, you know, <laughs> go to Lake Havasu and party for days. So when the time came, honestly, uh, my friends avoided me and they said, look, we love partying with you, but we don't trust you to sell us a house. You don't know crap. You've only been in the business, you know, X amount of days, basically. Mm. And I was, you know, surprisingly, I was really cool at that. And I go, you know what, you're right. I really don't know nothing, so fair enough. So what I had to do is I had to go back to what we call the basics, right? Expireds for sale by owners, open houses, and geographical farming. So I remember the, uh, I was dying for a listing and I was just a couple of weeks in the business and I couldn't get a, um, a listing, obviously. So I asked my neighbor, can I put a sign up in your yard? And he's like, well, sure, I guess. You know, I'd, if I can get my money, I'd actually sell it. So I remember the day the sign went in the yard, uh, the phone started ringing. I was like, sure enough, holy crap, I was getting buyer leads, right? I actually got a seller lead that first day, and I said, well, this is super important that I really concentrate on farming because this works, right? And, and you saw it happen almost instantly. Inst it was the day. And the, and the interesting thing was we didn't have internet back then. The only cell phone I had was a fake one, and I'd just be in pictures in it, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so the reality was is I had to go back to the basics, and I had to focus and really – study uh, how to, you know, blow up the neighborhood. Uh, back then, I went to Craig Proctor, went to Mike Ferry. Um, you know, I did everything I could. I was kind of what you call a seminar whore. And I just, I got to learn everything I could. I learned everything I could. And Craig Proctor taught me a lot about uh, open houses and how to really blow them up. We had the, we, did, we actually pioneered, I think, the first mega open house, right? You know, back then, the signs were five to ten signs. And, you know, I was the first agent to really put 50 out, you know, sometimes up to 100 as I was able to afford them. And uh, I learned a lot about geographical farming. And pretty soon, I was the celebrity in the neighborhood. Everybody looked up to me, everybody came to me for advice, and all I was doing was advertising other people's listings, other people's solds. Uh, I was doing so you a, would do an open house and just leverage it to the max? Yeah, it wouldn't even be my listing. I had no way, you know, I didn't have a listing, so I'd just use other people's listings and do the open houses, similar they do today with our low inventory. Um, but pretty soon I just realized, look, the more you stand out, the more people know your name. And, and, I, and I honestly think I coined that old phrase, house sold name. And I was always looking for new and innovative, innovative ways to be different than everybody else. Um, we had a bunch of agents in our neighborhood that really, they, had, they owned the neighborhood. And I just said, I got to get better. I got to do better things. And the better giveaways, the tchotchkes, um, more, yeah. more frequent updates, that kind of stuff. More and, touches. Uh, yeah, so honestly, it was just like I kind of owned the neighborhood, and it only took me 90 days to get my first couple listings, and then six months to a year. You know, I owned it, and then I just started expanding a little bit here and there and there, and 
and before you knew it, I was selling four or five houses a month just for my farm. So what would you say, because if, if a mega open house is kind of the way that kind of broke the door open for you, how often were you doing them, and why don't you run me through just a 60-second overview of what one would look like? So what one would look like, I'd schedule an open house for a Sunday, I'd start Monday, I'd make the flyers, get them done. Back then, we'd take pictures and glue them on the flyers, because we didn't have that type of print. God, I'm and hit the right? photocopy machine? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then I would door knock the entire neighborhood. And then I would go even outside of the neighborhood to the local condos, apartment buildings, and say, hey, are you looking to buy? And so I'd door knock a lot. So that was my two or three days ahead of time. Then I'd get on the phone and I'd just start calling. Back then, if, I don't know if you remember, I don't know if you're even old enough to remember, but, <laughs> but they had, uh, the title companies actually had all the people's phone numbers. Having phone numbers was normal back then. So we just call it cold calling. I'd just say, hey, it's Mike Bjorkman. I'm having a house at one, open house at 123 Cherry Street. I'd like to invite you. And, uh, you know, I did all the giveaways. I did the drawings and, um, you know, you come over. If you get there before 12, I'll give you a free bottle of wine. Mm. I just used really innovative ways to get people there. And then I'd have my friends and relatives, not relatives necessarily, but my friends, my sphere. I would tell them, okay, come by just for fun. Come by. Just for fun, come so by. So are you... Um how, so basically, you're circle dialing to get people there, mm -hmm. and how many calls are you making on the, on the average? Well, back then, I was a big Mike Ferry guy, right? So I had to make 100 calls a day, period. I had the pennies in the jar trick, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. And then I'd do that, and then I'd go door knocking, and that's what I, that's what I loved about summertime. I'd be door knocking until 9 o'clock at night sometimes. Love that. So tip one, mega open houses. It's a great way to start. It's a great way to kind of like kick the door in on the neighborhood and kind yeah. of announce that you're here. Um, if you're doing that, what, every weekend pretty much? Uh, yeah, I was, I was, you know, on my own, you know, and I had a lot of bills. And, and, I, and I started looking around at the real estate agent's lifestyles, Mercedes, big homes. I'm like, I have to have that. I right? got to get in on that. I got to get in on some of that. And it, 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 can we plug my podcast at all? Sure, this? of course. So, uh, Realestatemarketingshow.com. Some of the other things that I did was expires and for sale by owners. And I really leveraged those um, for listing leads as well. So if you guys want to get on that and listen to the, there's two hours of open house training, hour of expires, hour of for sale by our two hours of for sale by owners. There's tons of that, but that, yeah, that all well the, worth the list. It'll definitely. break this all down for him. Let's put Perfect. it that way. Number two, let's talk about some unique selling propositions because yep. I know you're really big on kind of standing out and being different, which I mm -hmm. think is very important if you're going to kind of separate yourself from the pack. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, you know, uh, running in that Craig Proctor circle back in the early days was unique selling propositions were huge and unique marketing mm -hmm. for that matter. You know, I was, uh, he's the one that taught me a man outstanding in his field with pictures of you in the field and then suitcase and a tie, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> but really it was the also sell your home in 90 days or it's free. If I don't sell your home in 30 days, I'll pay you. I'll buy it. You know, yeah. Uh, one of the biggest things that worked for me that he taught me was quick over the phone market evaluation. Because it, back then it started where people were not wanting necessarily for you to come there, but a quick over the phone, mm, yeah, they I liked that, that, right? right. And, then it, and then we kind of moved into the free computerized. Because back then agents, most agents couldn't use the computer, but I got on the DOS MLS and you know they usually dropped off you know, just paper comps and I, yeah. so I used a lot of the computerized electronic, all the modern things. And, and I learned fast that, uh, a lot of people really like that high technology. You know, I was young, aggressive, and I used their unique value propositions. I, I really found out, wow, those really work quick. You know, I'd, I'd people would call me to sell their house and they go, I go, why would you call me to sell your house? What, who referred you? Oh, well, I saw that you said you'll sell my home in 90 days or it's free. I'd like to hear more about that. To this day, we still use that mm -hmm. and it still gets ring. Uh, phone calls. Um, we did summer, winter, fall, and uh, spring promotions. You know, we're having a spring special right now. If you if you list your home during the month of spring, you won't have to pay for your escrow. We'll pay for your home warranty, your termite, your upfront home inspection, all that kind of stuff. Then another good one was, um, if you buy this house from me, we'll buy yours. And that made my phone ring. People didn't understand. What? You'll buy my so house if I buy So how does a program like that work? Because I'm sure you get the what's the catch response to some of these yeah it's it's super simple for that particular one is you know i'll buy your house we'll put it on the market as a traditional sale for 90 days if it doesn't work minus 10 percent for closing costs minus 10 percent convenient fee i'll buy it at eight cents on the dollar and you get 80 percent even today zillow has found out an open door they found out that a lot of people want to take those offers nine times out of ten somebody would say i don't want to do that right 
And then one time it actually happened to where I had to call my investor friend up and say, hey, I need you to buy this house. Like, like right now. I couldn't afford that, right? I couldn't even yeah. get a hard money loan back then. Right. So, and that's something that you can offer just by working with an investor, right? You don't mm -hmm. necessarily need to do that yourself. Yeah. You can line up with an investor in your local market. Absolutely. And you can offer that same pitch. Hey, if it doesn't sell, I'll buy it. And by mm -hmm. I'll buy it, I mean my <laughs> partner. Yeah, it's funny how people have this fear of their home not selling. You know, it's it's really weird. We're so accustomed to homes blowing off the market in two seconds nowadays, but in a declining or a stable market, which a lot of these agents haven't seen, to have a home on the market for six months is normal. Mm -hmm. And to have it on the market for a year could be normal too. Like all of our listing agreements, they're all a year. And that was just normal back then, right? I mean. Sometimes it takes six months, sometimes it doesn't. So yeah. we're kind of spoiled in this market since about 2011 when it bounced back. It's a long time. A lot of us have forgotten what a crappy market's like yeah. or even a stable market. You know, the inventory is, you know, in our area, we're supposed to be somewhere around 12 to 1500. And we've been floating at three to 400 for five years, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And our, and our town's doubled in size since the time of a stable market. So it's pretty unbelievable to watch. It's moving fast. Sure is. Yeah, it's moving fast. So the next thing I got here on the old yellow pad is <laughs> um, events and speaking. Let's actually do those separately because I think yeah, there's there's right. events that you can go to and just kind of see and be mm -hmm. seen. And then there's speaking opportunities that you can get. So right. why don't we touch on the events first? What do you what what sort of events should you be well, looking for? You know, the thing I did first and and Nobody does it, and it's probably the thing to hurt you the most as an agent, especially if you're trying to, anytime you're speaking at an event, you're an authority, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. So I can't remember who taught me. It might have been, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But I started doing first-time homebuyer seminars, all right? And when you do that, it makes you an authority. And I had a pretty good attorney, pretty good CPA, and I had the vendors, and they really helped advertise and bump those up. And, and I studied first-time homebuyers so much at the time that I was the authority. Mm -hmm. And then I would submit that uh, for free to the newspapers, and they started printing half-page ads. Mike Bjorkman, local power realtors, doing a first-time homebuyer seminars. And then we would teach people how to buy foreclosures, and we would teach people uh, you know, what short sales were after the earthquake in 94, I was really big in that short sales. And so I'd have short sale seminars and I was like, wow, man, the people would line up to talk to me afterwards. You know, I was out there humping it in hundred degree heat, just sweating balls. And then I'm sitting now, I'm in a hotel room right. on a Friday night and people are buying me drinks lined up to talk to Run, me. Running from the back of the room. So I'm like, dude, you know what? Being a celebrity is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. People want to line up and talk to you. That's... I mean, who gets that, right? So all these different seminars is really how I found out speaking is powerful, right? It's, it's a really big deal. Where would you say for like a local realtor, where would they, where would they want to start for getting into sort of C and B scene type of events? Well, I, I, I always believe, I firmly believe you should go to two to four events a week. And if you don't want to work 15 hour days, fine. Go to the beach till two or three, right? It doesn't matter. And then afterwards, go to your chamber event. And um, I started getting into nonprofits and charity. So I would want to volunteer at all times, roll up my sleeves, get dirty with them. I bought a moving van for the charities to use. Uh, that was a super huge hit, and that made me an instant celebrity having a moving van driving around, you know, a huge billboard. We're gonna get to that, that's the closer. Okay, awesome, and then we had, um, uh, it, it was just, you know, hanging out with good people and going to the events and hanging out with, you know, politicians and business owners. Uh, the chamber, you know, that was the best thing. And, and I, and I should probably point out most agents go, I don't want to go to a chamber mixer because there's like 48 agents and four people. Well, the first time I went to a chamber event, I was actually dragged there by my, at the time, fiance. She goes, you have to go to these. This is where all the business people are. I'm like, I don't want to be all mucky, mucky, whatever. I put on a suit and did it. And I knew a couple of people at the chamber mixer and they said, hey, so-and-so wants to talk to you or so-and-so would come up to me and say they want to talk about buying or selling a home. And I was, I'm always very blunt, you know me. And I said, why would you, why would you call me when these people have been in this chamber forever? Well, I'm like, ah, just like high school, little clicks and <laughs> yeah. drama mamas, you know? Yeah. So different personality styles and, you know, I've always studied personality styles and I can adapt and um, get along with anybody, whether you're super rich and snooty, whether you're homeless, whether you're just normal, cool, fancy, schmancy, it doesn't matter. And that's what I think one of my specialties was, is uh, I studied Tony Alessandra back in the early 90s and, and I was just able to work a room. 
And I, and I learned quickly, you don't just walk into a room, you take it over. Why don't you talk about like how you're able to leverage those events for right. business and how you can go in and take over the room? So I'll try to find out who's going to them, who's going to be sponsoring them, or you know, you kind of get a feel for who's there. But when I walk into the room, I scan the room quickly, and I'll say, I don't know that person, I don't know that person, I need to get to know this person better. So I'll pick you know, an event, if it's a three hour chamber mixer, say from six to nine or whatever, I'll pick four or five people that I absolutely have to pull off to the side, buy them a drink, get to know them intimately, and make damn sure that I have their cell phone number and I've connected with them on social media before I leave. I think one of the biggest takeaways I just took from what you said is the importance of actually rolling your sleeves up because I don't think it's really about the donations. I don't know that the donations are really, really going to get you in the door any further than, you know, it's the relationships, around, right? But when you roll up your sleeves and you're willing to get dirty and you're willing to go out there and like put in the work, mm -hmm. that's when the relationships deepen and that's mm -hmm. when you're able to leverage it. And it's a true win-win, right? The charity wins because they get manpower, they get mm -hmm. resources, they get donations, and you win because you get exposure and you get relationships. Yeah. And like you said, you get to be the big boss at the front of the room when everyone else is in there mm -hmm. kind of giving you the stink eye. Yeah, I mean, I have cuts and bruises on, but that nice tuxedo covers them pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of the way it is. You know, my wife is a great example. She She's, she's putting together this year's Boys and Girls Club auction. And honestly, getting checks isn't that hard. There's big corporations, companies, and you know, generous uh, individuals that'll write pretty big checks. However, the manpower is a big deal. And what I found out early on too, because I had no money, you know, per se, when I very first started rolling up my sleeves, but that's when you build relationships with people with a lot of money. People that truly care about these um, organizations, they do roll up their sleeves with you and you bond with them and spend a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how much attention the media will actually give you if you're on the boots on the ground kind of people. So I was always there, front page of the paper, cleaning up this, doing that, helping that, rescuing cats out of trees, all the bullshit, <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> just, yeah. the, just the way it was, man. Yeah. So, so I think that's a really big deal. And, you know, getting on the front page of all the magazines, you know, getting on the, uh, having them write stories about you all the time. And, and yeah, I, so oh, I think I that, ham, that's too. something you've done a really good job of is really getting your face out there in print. Would you say that that's because of all the things that you're leveraging or is, what would you say is the strategy there? Yeah, it's a huge strategy. There's always the guy that is, um, the professional like so back in the day i'll give, give you an example i was very strategic there was the photographer the local paper and i'd say where's the reporter and i'd meet the reporter and i'd say hey listen i want to do weekly articles for you they're dying for content everybody's dying for content right so i would write all the articles about the market what's going on they print that for free. Hey, do you mind if you put my headshot in there? That'd help out a little bit more, yeah. I think, get some attention. Oh, sure, there it is. Oh, you know, you know, it's 4th of July, we're having a big thing, and you know, it's a real big home shopping thing. How about if I wrote an article about that, we put that on the front page, mm. you know? And then it just started snowballing from there, and then the better relationships you have with the media, the more they want you. Yeah. So, I, I hate to say it, but like right now we're in a spot, Tammy and I, where the media fights over us. Like if, if we do a full page ad somewhere or they write a full page article, now the next one calls us and says, we want to do it too. Then the next one calls. Well, if you're in those two magazines, you've got to be in our magazine. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, and then after a while they just call you and just say, hey, we need you for this. We need you for that. No problem. We need you to show up at this and, event. We need you to help promote the event. And they're probably doing that because they know that you make it easy for them. Mm -hmm. They know that you bring massive value. And if you can make it easy and bring value to these publications, you're like a unicorn, right? They're looking for a good story that's easy to publish. And if you can provide that for them, I think you'll be one step ahead of the game. Yep. And all that stuff, it just snowballed into, you know, eventually our TV show. <laughs> You know, and once you've got your own TV show and that Man, you're, kind of you're content. You're hitting the points like right on the money here. So why don't we, why don't we roll right into the TV show? So you leveraged. And, and tell me what you mean by TV show well, or, or being on TV. So when I first met Tammy, she had, you know, the, the, you've heard the story. But the, the and Tammy's Mike's business yeah, partner. Yeah, my business partner. Leader, for better half. So shout out to Tammy. What's up? <laughs> Not my wife, my business partner. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she, um, she had a TV show and I was like, hmm. 
I was kind of bitching, right? So we were talking one night at an auction, and she said, you know, or I said, I think to her, how about a, a real estate segment? People love buying homes. It's really important to talk about. And she's like, yeah. So she invited me on the show. It was a big hit. I got the content. I got to snip the footage. I got to promote it all over the place that I was on the TV show. And then created, maintained the relationship strategically throughout the station and the community. And then when her co-host um, quit, I naturally just filled right in. And then we took it totally to the next level. Mm. Um, and now, you know, I was known as the local celebrity realtor, but now I'm known as the TV show guy. But that was cool because, you know, that was to bring on all the non-profits. Anything that happened in our town, they wanted to come on TV to talk about it and promote it. Right. Yeah. So now we're dealing with the biggest owners, mucky muckies, decision makers, interviewing them three to five times a day, which was spectacular for not only content, but, you know, rubbing elbows with the right people. And that's that's what it's all about. So, you know, looking back from the little open houses to a TV show and everything that, you know, strategically was done in place along the road, it's, yeah. you know, it's kind of nice. I'd like to teach everybody how to do it because it took me. 20 years, but now I have all the secrets. I could, now you I could take somebody from nobody to, you know, rock star in maybe three to five years. And that's just leveraging all of these steps one after another to kind of build upon your name and your, your brand. Yeah, it's being super aware of what the hell you're doing. You just can't go hang out in a corner at a room. You just can't be a bystander. You have to be the guy that takes charge and, you know, somehow, some way gets on stage. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's really important, getting on stage. Um, one, I got a total sidestep here, but a cool story about um, at the last Mastermind event, we were at Closing Table, speaking of doing what you got to do to get on stage. So a friend of ours, <laughs> Tristan, runs Lab Coat Agents, and he's putting on a big event for real estate professionals, probably have 500 people there. And one of the members of the group really wanted to be in on the stage for uh, a speaking spot and he was trying to figure out how to do it and so he ended up buying a Louisville slugger mm -hmm. bringing that to the event totally unannounced rolled in mid-session with the Louisville slugger over his bat dropped it on the table and all it said on it was I want some five minutes of your time to talk about getting on stage at lab coat by the way I bring the wood and just dropped it on his desk <laughs> that was awesome and and lo and behold, it worked. And now he's going to be speaking on stage yeah. at the Lab Coat event. So and that's another great example too. If you're going to talk about Tristan and Lab Coats, you know, I there was a, at the time I joined that Facebook page, there might have been 50, 60,000 people, right? Um, now it's 90. But I same thing as always, very strategically wanted to get to know Tristan, you know, um, for business and just for education and learning everything. But you heard who I was talking to before we came up on this in an hour yeah. like this. You know, yeah. we talk all the time, every day. So strategically, if you're a vendor or an agent or somebody who wants to get on a stage, and I will be speaking at Lab Coat, mm -hmm. uh, which I never would have been able to do if I didn't strategically go to the top. One thing that I'm picking up on as we're talking through this is, and, and I really want to touch on this because I think it's hugely important, is the way that you've always gone right to the top. Mm -hmm. And you've been strategic about who you go after. How are you going after them? And what is, what to, is the Mike it's Bjorkman process? It's a really good question. You know, I just learned a long time ago that whoever owns the restaurant can do more for you. Whoever owns the car dealership can do more for you. And when I say do more, so for instance, like if you wanted to buy a car right now, it didn't matter what it is. I know the owner of every dealership. And I can call them or text them and say, look, Oliver's a good friend of mine. He needs to buy a Mercedes, make sure he doesn't get jacked. Yeah. I'm gonna introduce you guys, put you on a group text, all that kind of thing. If I went to a normal car salesman, what could he do? A, he can't get me a good deal. I'm gonna have to go running around through all these closers. Right. And B, it's, I'm not a big deal. I can sit in financing for two, hours. three hours, right? I've ever been through that. You know, C, he knows people he could refer you to, but the owner of the restaurant, the business, the corporation, they're the dad of the business, right? So every employee, every manager at some point goes to the boss and says, hey, I'm thinking about buying a house or I'm thinking right. of selling a house. They try to be as intimate as possible with their boss because they always have an agenda of promotions and you know, expanding their business. So if the boss trusts you, every single person below ends up as a client. It's amazing how many times 
that. That's a great tip. I want you to say that again. <laughs> because if the boss knows you and trusts you, the entire organization becomes a client. Absolutely. We always use Ford, family, occupation, recreation, dreams, right? Those are the things we talk about. And then we, we, we pull out things that, for instance, the guy at the restaurant the other night. Um, I said, what do you like to do, man? You're, what do you, you know, he's talking about Ford. And he goes, I love to golf. And I said, no shit. I'm a member of Valencia Country Club. He's like, no way. Are you really? Could you take me? I'm like, yeah, and I'll buy drinks. Course, yeah. Yeah. So it might cost me two, 300 bucks for the day. Get the guy liquored up, take him to a really nice golf course, you know, and you know, we'll be friends for life. Right. You know, you golf for four hours. What do you know about a guy? You either know you hate him or yeah. love him. Yeah, that's, that's a great it. way to pre-qualify your friends. Yeah. You cannot possibly not be super tight with anybody you golf with for four hours. I mean, that's just one-on-one, -on -one individual, good quality bonding time. So yeah, I'll take this guy out. So for instance, he's the boss of how many people? You know, 20 people that work at a restaurant at least. Yeah. Maybe some of them can't afford to buy a house, but who cares? But this dude, it's his job to go around and meet, strategically meet, the richest people in our town and he even told me he's like yeah I've been working on that couple over there for a while he's like dude they're buying $40 shots and they're on the third one they got they don't care they ordered like two meals each he's all their bill's gonna be like four or five hundred bucks I want to hang out with those people I'm like see that's what I do too so yeah. And then, so he gets to be friends with them. They just talk casually. So what are you doing? Oh, we're thinking about putting our house on the market. No doubt. You know Mike Bjorkman? I've heard of him. Well, yeah. he's a great guy. Oh, you got to meet Mike. He's my boy. Yep. Yeah. That's how it works. So every day I'm intentionally creating those stars to align. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, being strategic, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think you got to have long vision. It's not about just coming in. It's not a smash and grab. It's really about building your reputation up over time and doing it in a way where you're adding value and gaining trust and building credibility. And that's when the phone starts ringing. Like, right, mm -hmm. once you once you become friends with the boss, uh, you know, or or you make those connections of leaders in the community and leaders in, in different charities, then all of a sudden you've got all these people that know you, like you, trust you, and want to refer you business. And it's amazing when I walk into a room uh, or walk into a golf tournament or something and, you know, make a really big deal out of it. There's, you know, a lot of people that look and say, oh, hey, Mike's here. And then, you know, there's always that one person that walks into the room that people flow to. I want to be that guy at all times. Mm -hmm. So, I, again, strategically, I'll scan, I'll wink, wave, this, that, hey, to where they all start coming at once, to where there will be a crowd around me at all times no matter what I'm doing, whether it's at a restaurant, whether I walk into a charity event or a golf tournament. And I just do that on purpose because I feel like if I do that, then other people will say, who's that? I want to meet him too. Mm -hmm. I want to be around him mm -hmm. too. Then they'll say- It's like the old Studio 54 effect, right? <laughs> they put up the velvet rope and you can't, the big crowd's outside the velvet rope and everybody wants to get inside and see what's going on. Perfect example. Yeah. Perfect example. That's why, you know, and I always tell people it takes money to spend money. You know, I took my kid to a, a private school that I think, you know, at the end of the day was two grand a month. People are like, I am not spending two grand a month to be, have my kid at the best, you know, at a private school. And I said, watch what I'm doing. So let's add this up 24 grand a year. I pull 250 grand a year out of that mofo. Like that's just, you know, the country club. It's a great return country on club. Investment. Let's say it's thousand, fifteen hundred bucks a month, depending if I go or not. But you know, at the end of the day, 250 grand a year comes out of the country club, yeah. right? The same thing happened with the boat club. I pulled out. So it takes a little bit of money to make money. I'm not afraid. And I think that's a big mental shift because I think a lot of people have a block about you know, paying those types of, those fees on mm -hmm. certain things. And, you know, another perfect example is a friend of ours, he only flies first class, and he looks at it like that's his opportunity for networking. He mm -hmm. flies first class because he wants to be talking to the other people that fly first class, and he <laughs> wants so to get good. to know them, right? right? And so if you look at it in terms of, like, the amount of commissions that you can pull out, I mean, I mean you're spending 24K a year mm -hmm. to make... 250k. I mean, that that's a no-brainer. That's right. a lot better than the best advertising campaigns you're going to be running. I'll give you an amazing example of that. And I'm a super airplane snob. Like, dude, I barely could get to San Francisco when we were there last week without dying on South freaking West. So if it's over an hour, my rule is I fly first class. So I do. 
right? But I'm strategic about that. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? And I met a lot of people. And uh, I was going to Dallas one time for a REO conference. And sitting next to a guy and just started chit chat and he's going to Dallas who lives there start talking to him he ended up being one of my very biggest REO accounts he was a uh, executive at Bank of America and we bonded for two and a half hours right. and at the end of the day again I got hooked up with the asset managers I mean, and and I don't know you know a lot of people don't remember that recession but it was pretty rough so to get through 2009 10 and 11 that one account probably brought me a couple hundred grand a year. Social is the next point, tying it all together with social. So mm -hmm. you're just filming the things that you're already doing. You're filming the speaking engagements. <clears throat> you're yep. taking pictures, shaking hands. You're getting with the celebrity in the room and getting a picture with them. Oh, I so love doing that. <laughs> I, right? It's hard to do that, but I do it. I'm like, like you'll see me tomorrow with some of the big wigs speaking here. I'll be like, hey, you just get in the picture yeah. with me. Yeah, and you'll be on there. I am on Instagram, looking all badass. Hey, I'm yeah. hanging out with so and so. Yeah, you know, whether you know, perceptions, everything. And I think I think you said it perfectly. Don't be afraid to be awesome. Like he was out there doing his thing in Antarctica or Alaska, or <laughs> wherever you were, <laughs> flying around, and you know, he picked up clients out of that because of that. Because people are going to see what you're doing, and the people that don't relate are going to reject it and move on and that's okay but the people mm -hmm. that do relate and do resonate with you and do appreciate what you're doing those are the people that are going to fall more in line with you and what yep. you're doing and that's when you start getting the phone calls from those give you a huge facebook tip right now and it works i almost i don't think i've ever told anybody this before oh this is good Stop um, the presses <laughs> It's really important. So I strategically try to friend request or at least follow all the big wigs, right? So I'll see them do in a life, in a life event. Vacations are a huge life event, especially in corporate America. If you're a LinkedIn person, you get this. Um, they only get two weeks a year vacation for the most part. And they do something usually pretty badass. Right, you know, so this one guy was. So you're at, talking about the corporate ballers. The, the corporate ballers. So right. this corporate baller in our town, he went to Atlantis um, and stayed in this amazing suite, like made our suites today look like crap. So I reached out to him and I said, Bro, I don't know what you did to get that suite, but I have to know. I go, That was the most amazing trip. You actually fulfilled my whole week. I just, I just want to live that through you. And he replied back, Hey, I've heard of you. Let's go have lunch. <laughs> Perfect. Boom. Client. But I do that all the time. I reach out and say, that was an amazing trip you took. I really want to know more about that. Because if somebody goes drops 10 grand on a suite or something, they want to talk about it. Yeah. They're not going to go brag about it at right. the company to their employees. But That's if they really feel like good. you're on their level, they're That's like, really good. let me tell you this and this yeah. and then they're like hey, you know yeah and that always happens so so i reach out to people's life events a lot i think that's that's an interesting perspective too because you're really working social media you're not just posting stuff for the sake of posting stuff i think that there's a lot of opportunities there because as people go on these really amazing vacations they're definitely posting them so they're easy to find <laughs> yep. and when you find those people and just reach out hey that was a really cool uh, bar that you pulled up to in St. Thomas. I'd love to yeah. know where that is because when I go to St. Thomas one day, I'm going to want to definitely check that out. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're in report. Yep. And I love it. And, and that's why I try to be so extravagant. Not, not only am I very spoiled in life, but I try to be extra extravagant so those people do reach out to you and they do every single time. Holy crap, I've been there. Holy crap, I want to go there. Holy crap, holy crap, holy crap, let's do this together. Let's own no more. Mm -hmm. And now you're on the level with people that you want to be doing business with. So let's just keep rolling on. I got point number nine, which is swag and clothes. I think that's something you do really well. You've got a ton of Team Bjorkman gear. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Because I feel like that's definitely not a step one, right? That's definitely once you're a little bit more established. That, that all came back from open houses. And back then I'd say, okay, so I'm gonna buy 500 little pumpkins with my logo on it, uh, notepads, pens, whatever. People love that crap. People like free stuff. And I learned early, don't buy things that people will throw away. So I started getting into just very basic stuff like um, beer koozies, you know, good neoprene koozies. Nobody throws those away. You know, pens, not too many people throw away. Notepads, people usually keep, you know, and just keychains, just stuff like that. And then as I got a little more successful, I'd say, well, I call them guilt gifts. So if I had a really good lead at an open house, 
And so you know what? Hold on. Pull them back and say, here's a really nice Team Bjorkman wine opener, mm. corkscrew, that kind of stuff, or something cool. Like, uh, remember back in the day, they used to have uh, like little things you stick your pens on your desk. They're like oak and all. You know, just ten dollar gifts, but if you buy fifty of them, make them feel special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I walk into a listing appointment, I'd say, here is. Thank you for your time. Here is this. So I call them guilt gifts, right? Like I can't kick this guy out of my house. I have to list with him now. He gave yeah, me a corkscrew. Yeah. Even if 90% of it got thrown away, that 10% is still people out there marching around with your name and your logo on their hat, mm -hmm. on their chest, on their koozies, on their this, their that. And it's just, it's, it's, it's an unquantifiable way of branding. Your yeah. Name. And my Dickies line. And my Dickies line, I call it. I just buy all the Dickies. <laughs> I love Dickies stuff. I don't know why. But people say, oh, I want that. I go, no, you don't. And I say that. And they go, yes, I do. I go, we, if I got that for you, would you really wear it? And they say, yeah, absolutely. So it, I'd say at least once or twice a week. People love going on vacation and tagging me. I've been tagged in front of the Leaning Tower of Pisa where they're wearing my jackets and like <laughs> all over the world. And they're right. tagging me. People at the river tagging me with their beer koozies. Yeah. You know, I'm like, this is so good. Yeah. There's no bad situation where someone could be rocking your pen or koozie or hat mm -hmm. or jacket that just doesn't benefit. And just the more of that that you can have out in the streets, the more recognizable you're going to be. Yeah. Uh, the very last thing I have, and I think, and I know this is killing it for you guys, and I think that um, it's, I see some people doing it, but I don't see anybody doing it the way you guys are doing it, and that's the vans. Mm -hmm. The vans and the trucks. Tell me about that. How did that start? And throw some tips out there about getting vans. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting, and I, I have two stories. My first story was I got my moving van and I just copied somebody else, right? right. Well, that's a good idea. Move with me and use my van for yeah. free. So I got the van, I wrapped it, and, I, and the, within weeks I realized that, oh, I don't want to give this to clients. And I, I really bought it for charity anyways uh, because I started getting involved. And I know they, they go, we need vans to move crap around. They have auctions. That's how all charities, golf tournaments, they need to move stuff. Um, so that's, I found out right away, you know, the clients were running red lights or there's yellow paint on my bumpers all the time and the charities just treated them way better. But I went to go buy a billboard in my town off the freeway, the normal billboard. I didn't realize that those things were three to five grand a month, like fudge sickles, right? A month. That's no joke. So, okay. So I paid, I don't even know. I bought my, my, my the van I still have, I bought no seven. It's got 40,000 miles on it, but it cost me a couple grand to wrap it. So I said, the more that's driving around, that's a driving billboard. People were like going nuts. I see your van everywhere. I see your van everywhere. And, and it just really built the brand. Um, and I think on the top it said, um, for churches, charity, chamber, free, you know, something like that. Oh, and it good. said that across the top. Churches, chamber, charity. There's one more. Eh, anyways. Um, so everybody was talking about that. So, well, all right. So we bought a second one. Huge pain in the ass, but what would happen was I'd say, everybody would say, can I borrow it? I'd say, yeah, what do I get in exchange? Not like that, of course. It has to be a win-win. So that's how I was ending up at the front tables with all my friends. And I was getting the, the VIP parking and the VIP this and first at that and all that stuff. It was kind of interesting when I started my property management company. Um, I said, let's go buy another one. I worked for Team Bjorkman, why not do it? And instantly, same exact thing. The company started blowing up. And then I bought a van for the maintenance uh, person to drive around. Then we bought a van. Like right now, we're buying four hybrid Hyundai Sonatas for the staff to wrap and drive around in circles. Nice. And because uh, I know, because think about it, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people a day get to see this. And, you know, why pay three to five grand a month when you could pay three to five hundred a month? Now we got a German and a Persian guy in there. <laughs> Say what's up. That was so yeah. hard. That uh, was so hard to not break. I was, I was waiting for that. Did you tell them where you are already? Yeah. Talk what, about being a where celebrity. We are right now. That's what they're talking about. Dude, like, honestly, like ever, ever since before agents were talking about celebrifying wow. themselves, this guy's been doing it. I mean, from like, <laughs> from moving, moving trucks before moving trucks were cool to <laughs> ridiculous suits before ridiculous suits were cool. I want you to have We're going to go, go, go uh, drink somewhere. And so. Marcel's German, so we'll get him a translator. 
Works out. Works out. Yeah, yeah. You guys can't even speak. You're just partying together. I love it. (laughs) So we covered a lot of really great points today. A lot of really good strategies on how to become the celebrity in your market. I really want to thank Mike for coming out because I know your time is really valuable. So I'll cheers to that. Thanks, brother. And uh, really appreciate all your insights that you gave today. And I think I'm looking forward to implementing a lot of this stuff in our brokerage. And I hope that you guys found it valuable as well. And now you're in the know. Perfect. Right?